Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, quite an honor to be here. And uh, as you <coughs> just said, six men from India actually received the Victoria Cross during World War I. Um, in this case, we're talking about uh, the highest award of bravery and gallantry uh, presented by the British Empire. And uh, quite surprisingly, one of them was given over here on the same day that the Battle of Haifa took place on a different part of the country, uh, in the Jordan Valley. And in this case, we want to uh, honor a little bit this forgotten hero and forgotten battle, which happens exactly at the same hours as the Lancers were fighting over here in uh, Haifa. Uh, my name is Anthony Walsh, I'm the chairman of the Society for the Heritage of World War I in Israel, a society which is heavily involved with uh, quite a lot of activities, as I'll show in a second. However, before anything, I would like to thank the Historical Society of Haifa uh, for the event over here and for the honor of uh, inviting me to uh, talk over here, which I find quite amazing that we're actually on Allenby Street, which I think is quite an interesting coincidence, don't you think so? Um, the society itself uh, is, uh, as I'll explain in a minute, already a 15-year-old uh, thing, and we'll talk about what we do in a, f in a minute. Um, of course, we created a special uh, symbol to commemorate the centenary, and this is another opportunity to thank my wife, who's sitting over there in the back, who is the one who actually uh, did the work for that. Awesome. If I'll bring her all the precious stones I'm finding everywhere. <laughs> okay, so the Society for the Heritage of World War I in Israel, as I said, is existing for about uh, 15 years. Includes uh, many hundreds of people who are uh, attending. Some of them are actually seated over here as well. And some of them are also in both organizations, uh, like Eli Liran, like Igor Greiber, and others. We're organizing seminars, conducting field tours, delivering lectures and speeches like I'm doing at this moment producing publications, uh, participating in official ceremonies like tomorrow, uh, running an extensive website in Hebrew, which I must say is a little outdated, but good news, two weeks time, we're gonna have a new one uh, in the air. Uh, developing our collection of exhibits that we collected all over battlefields uh, through the country, and initiating all kinds of projects, especially signposts, uh, but not only. Um, I guess that if I have to put a finger and to say what really makes the society so unique is the combination of knowledge together with the intimate knowledge of the country itself, put, managing to put things together. And what I'm going to show you now is exactly a manifestation of that uh, idea. So we're talking about the great battle of Megiddo or the battles of Megiddo. Over here what we see is uh, the beginning of the event and we see here this line which represents a line that was nicknamed the line of the two Uja rivers or the two Aja, Uja of the two Uja one was a stream one was a dry valley uh, basically what happened was that the very first uh, part all this concentration of infantry divisions opened up in this direction opened up the Sharon uh, Valley in order to allow the cavalry, including all the Indian uh, forces that were involved, to break through towards the village Israel. The idea, and it was executed in the most incredible way, is that the Samaria Mountains <coughs> will become some sort of a gigantic trap when the, the EEF, Egyptian Expeditionary Force Forces, managed to circle all around and to close on the Samaria Mountains and to annihilate the two uh, Turkish armies, seven and eight, that were concentrated over there. Uh, okay, this is a more official map. I can't go into the fine details of it and it's not uh, of our interest at the moment, but basically what we see here is the mount, uh, movements of the mounted corps, which included basically four divisions, one of them active in the area to the south around Jericho, 
and into the Jordan Valley. However, three divisions make their way into uh, the north of Israel to close in and to close that trap. Here we're concentrating on the unique uh, battlefield, which is fairly unknown, uh, which we're talking about. This is, uh, of course, enlargement of a part of the previous map. We see here the area of Bet She'an of today, Bisan of that time. And we see here how we have uh, the movement of one of the brigades of the 4th Cavalry Division, in this case the 11th Cavalry Brigade, which included two uh, Indian uh, regiments and one British one. Uh, the map is not exactly going into the finest details for obvious reasons. Basically, the movement was on both banks of the Jordan River, as we're going to see in a few seconds. Just to understand what area I'm talking about, this is an updated uh, map that shows us the battlefield in general in today's terms and today's uh, places. We see Bet She'an up here at the top, okay, and we're talking about an area of the south part of the Bet She'an Valley, an area of very famous kibbutzim, most of them, by the way, religious ones, like Tirat Svi, Zde Eliyahu, and all that area. The battlefield itself is roughly this area over here. Okay, so here's the, I took uh, quite a lot of work. As, I, as you see, the thing here is a family a business. So I asked my son, has better technology than I have, to assist me at least putting on the maps together. And from there on, uh, I had to work on my own with all the works, but with all the details. But still, what we see here are two <laughs> maps of 1918, including updates of the last moment. I'm talking about the beginning of September 1918, which will be in a different color. Uh, for example, we see here, village. Wasn't in the original map. This was an add-on uh, as a result of uh, aerial uh, photography that revealed that things changed in the last minute and they were all updated into the map that was uh, available for the people. Mind you, this is still an incredible map on its own. It's based on the PEF, Palestine Inspiration Fund, a map that was drawn by hand in 1870 and into the 1880, um, which means we don't have hair counters, we cannot really understand heights and things like that. And listen, to achieve what they achieved in this type of uh, sources of information, quite remarkable just to understand the extent of the success. Military groups are coming here to study the battles of Megiddo till this very day. I'm escorting every month or two, uh, one or two British, mostly in, uh, British army, but not only, uh, who come over to explore because they think it's just absolutely incredible how people could achieve what they had achieved 100 years ago. From the area, not too far from Tel Aviv of today, all the way to Bisan, Bet She'an, in something like 36 hours on horse. And not to mention all the um, people, they, the prisoners that they had to take in, and supplies, logistics, just think about that. In today's terms, it would be a very, very, very difficult thing to achieve 100 years ago. Wow. Anyway, so the three uh, regiments are moving on the east side. Jacob's Horse on the uh, uh, West Bank, Lancers 29, and the Middlesex Yeomanry. And when they arrive roughly at this area, they will uh, encounter for the first time, oops, pressing something. There you are. <coughs> okay, don't, uh, it's not that uh, good visible, but there are two green lines here. This one and this one. This is when they encounter for the first time uh, uh, something, some sort of a uh, touch with uh, Turkish forces. In this case, they are covering uh, what would be the movement over here of a tremendous amount of uh, Turkish army who somehow understood what was happening and those brave people were trying to bake their way out of the trap to the one very little <coughs> section that was left open on the Jordan River between Damia Bridge 
which was taken by the New Zealanders the day before, and all the way up to Bisan, which was in the hands already for a couple of days. When, those, uh, when the information about that came in, they were sent over to the south to block and to intercept and to prevent the people from doing that. One of those who escaped over here, by the way, was uh, the commander of the 7th Army, Mustafa Kamal, later on known as Atatürk, the founder of modern Turkey. At this uh, moment, we're coming to the big event of the day. Um, not too far from the area which today is Zdet Rumot, a moshav, just down in that valley, which will be roughly over here. Uh, the 29th Lancers are coming into action. Uh, the British commander is putting a machine gun at a place called Tel Teumil, or Tel El Tum of that time. And he's sending some of his people to do uh, the battle itself. Some are trying to outflank the main hold of the Turkish line. However, some are heading right on. We are able today to pinpoint that because of one report that is mentioning a small mound in the, little, in the center of the area and a few buildings next to it. The buildings prove how uh, that uh, add-on information about the village uh, is making itself because that's the only possible way to identify which one of the many different mounds that we have over there would be the appropriate one. And today we can say with certainty that we're talking about this area, which is roughly Kibbutz Zdei of today, roughly. During that, uh, sorry, let's go back for a second. During this, when moving on, uh, one of uh, the Indians um, troop commanders identifies that there's a problem, there's that mound, and there's a too strong of a, of a body of uh, Turks over there with machine guns covering and uh, causing many casualties to the regiment. Uh, he charges over, manages to take the place. However, during that, he will be mortally wounded. And as we hear it, he will receive the Victoria Cross after. This is the citation about that. Um, for the most conspicuous bravery and self-sacrifice in the morning of 23rd of September, 1918, note, the same time of Haifa, when his squadron charged a strong enemy position on the west bank of the Jordan between the river and Hes Samaria, that's the Tumot of today, a village. On nearing the position, Residar de Adlul Singh realized that the squadron that was suffering casualties from a small hill on the left front, occupied by machine guns and 200 infantry. Without the slightest hesitation, he, co he collected six other air ranks and with greatest dash and an entire disregard of danger, charged and captured the position, thereby saving many havoc casualties to the squadron. He was mortally wounded on the very top of the hill when capturing one of the machine guns single-handed. But the guns and infantry had surrendered before him as uh, before he died. His valor and initiative were of the highest order. For that, he was granted Victoria Cross. This is from the Imperial War Museum in, uh, in London. And uh, his Victoria Cross, as we can see, is kept uh, over there. And it's also mentioned in the place where all the different uh, Victoria Cross uh, recipients are commemorated. Interesting, interesting, but someone commissioned one of the British artists who specialized actually in horses and things like that, uh, not necessarily an expert on military thing. And he uh, was commissioned uh, to create this uh, work, which is describing the final charge of Badalu Singh. This is exactly it. Um, is the scenery exactly the same? Most likely not. But again, the intention and especially the fact that someone did commission that. My only guess would be that someone in that area, uh, some of the British uh, gentlemen of that area, served with the Indian Army and decided that this event must be honored. I'm still trying to uh, track uh, the details of why he was commissioned for that. Only a short while ago, two years ago, uh, we find this 
uh, this is coming from the Indian press. And as you see, uh, we have here, I must say, a bit strange to me because the soil that was collected is, of course, not of the place where Badlu Singh was killed and remitted. It is actually from the place where he is commemorated in Cairo, Heliopolis. But still, interesting uh, quote, and this is, again, not that long ago. So we, as we see, he is uh, remembered. However, here's the incredible thing. All the major books relating to World War I in this part of the world, in the Holy Land, the idea is not mentioned even in one of them. Not the official British history, not the, the Book of the Desert Mountain Core, and so on. Quite a few different books. His memory is living through other places, but not through the official books, which is so, so strange to me. Back to the battle, last stages. After that, uh, the Yeomanry, sorry, because they're suffering from terrible, uh, uh, heavy fire from that covering um, rear party, which is covering the retreat of the major force. Uh, a battery of Royal Horse Artillery is sent down from Nissan, galloping all the way down and eventually putting themselves right here, which is just next to the Trumont of today. As they start to fire, a concealed Turkish battery is opening a very, very, very accurate fire and hitting them quite severely. In the meanwhile, the commander of the brigade, uh, Gregory, is sending his yeomanry around in a big flank, and he's sending them not to the major crossing point, which is here, but to the south where he identified another column of Turks retreating. As they arrive over there, we have the last or one before the last stage of the battle, when Jacob's horse is moving over from this side, the Lancers are now moving towards the front line. One of them is joining, going across on a different crossing and joining in with the Jacob's horse. However, in the meanwhile, the Middlesex Yeomanry are charging with their swords and uh, capturing the guns of the uh, concealed uh, Turkish army, as uh, the concealed battery, sorry. So as they succeed in doing that, that is probably the breaking point of the Turkish uh, force. They don't have the artillery support anymore, and uh, everyone is closing on them from all directions. And so uh, we have the final stage around Mahdat Abu Naj, which is the uh, crossing of Abu Naj. Um, and we see how the, uh, the Jacob's horse, the Lancers, and the Yeomanry are closing in, an incredible defeat of co complete collapse of the Turkish army, a tremendous amount of casualties, more than 4,000 were, captur were captured, tremendous amount of supplies. Among those who fell, uh, who were imprisoned, we see this quite remarkable uh, photo from one day after, the 24th of September, and these are near Veshan of today, and the interesting thing is this gentleman over here. This gentleman is actually a division commander of the 16th uh, Turkish division who fell also in prison and was uh, taking over um, as a part of the great victory one day before. So this is the battlefield we were talking about here. We see Mahdad Abu Naj. The battle continued the following day. We're not gonna go into that details, but uh, further on, as we see, they're moving south to another passage called El Masudi, still exists. All these uh, battlefields can be visited today. Here is from the official British history, a map showing us the details of that battle, but again, we won't go into that today. And uh, I'm now in touch with quite a lot of people over there. And uh, the idea is we hope that we'll be able soon to commemorate this uh, gallant Indian and uh, British cavalryman by erecting some sort of a lookout, signposted lookout, uh, and a memorial at this battlefield. Thank you. Thank you, Iran. <laughs>